Aggressor Adventures. For over 35 years, we've designed adventure vacations around the world, helping travelers experience the majesty of the oceans and the call of the wild on our dive trips, river cruises, and safaris. From the Galapagos Islands and the South Pacific to the land of the pharaohs on the Nile River, with personalized service in every vacation destination. Aggressor, adventures of a lifetime. From the Apostrophe Podcast Network. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. I'm a passionate fan of stand-up comedy. Sketch comedy, sure. Musical comedy, eh, rarely. But stand-up, I can't get enough of it. It's my personal stress relief, second only to time spent in nature. I'm not a fan of the screamers, like Chris Rock, or the comedians who can only get their laugh with a stream of constant expletives. Eddie Murphy accepted, of course. Nor am I a fan of the self-obsessed rants like Dave Chappelle, although he does have some brilliant moments. I'm a fan of intelligent, well-thought-out, well-considered, and well-crafted stand-up comedy. I myself couldn't tell a joke to save my life. Believe me, I've tried and failed miserably every single time. But when incredible insight, diligent research, and skillful craft are brought together with a high intelligence and perfect delivery, I am in awe. The list of names is too long to get into here, but you know them all. I think for the most part, a comedian needs to be one thing if they are anything. Intelligent. The first time I saw Ron James was likely on CBC television in Canada, and I was in awe. Not only could he deliver a Shakespearean rant about the liquor barn, the liquor barn, let's all go to the liquor barn, with equal tenacity as he would deliver something political, and do it in a way that would make the greatest thespians and lyricists blush. But he did it all with such wonderfully inbred Canadianism, it felt like it was all our own. He's all ours, Canada. Don't get me wrong, Rick Mercer is a brilliant comedic mind. Maybe the most famous for his Rick's rants, but Ron's rants are sheer comedic poetry that would make Walt Whitman envious. I can still remember his routine. Ah, there she is, that bovine Betty with the nationwide ass. It's a reference to a certain kind of server, special only to Northern Ontario, and I'm still laughing about it. There's a funny little thing that goes on that the public will never be privy to. It's between entertainers of all stripes. Musicians, actors, comedians, and the like, we are always willing to meet each other. That's how I ended up playing on stage with Alice Cooper. He was a fan of Survivor Man. Those of us in the entertainment industry are always willing to meet another simply because, I think, we all know what each other has had to go through to get to wherever it is we are at in our career. We, for lack of a better way of saying it, get each other. So it was without issue that I somehow or another got an email address for Ron James. I contacted him and one day met him backstage at the Gravenhurst Opera House. It's a theater just across the street in Gravenhurst, Ontario, from the old Albion Hotel, where, by the way, I used to go and get drunk at age 16 and watch my inbred cousins beat up the visiting hockey team. And I mean beat up badly. As I would leave, having not thrown a single punch, I would just make a motion like, yeah, I'm with them and walk out the door with a half a dozen Canadian rednecks, my cousins, who just mopped the floor with an entire hockey team from Brantford, Ontario. But I digress. On a blistery cold northern Ontario winter night, I met Ron at the door of his tiny little dressing room backstage in the theater. Inside was an attention deficit disorder patient's dream. About 75 single pages laid out and lined up on every surface in the room in a particular order. God help Ronnie if a wind blew in. It was his comedy script for the night. Before I had a chance to back away slowly, we got past the pleasantries and within 15 minutes realized we were long-lost brothers from other mothers. Looking into the souls within our eyes, we both knew one thing. 
we got out. We had escaped what should have been our destinies. He's not working for the phone company, and I'm not loading crates in some warehouse. And thus began a friendship. These are the words of Ron James. Why does it matter to matter? That's a great question. Because I think you'd be sinning against your purpose in life if you didn't. Well, I never realized you were so immature. Still, you won't change my mind. I'd like to keep it pure. And she just administered a catheter to his penis. And I went around to his side of the bed. She was pulling her hand away and he said, Ronnie, look at this beautiful young nurse just picked up for me at Canadian Tire. (laughs) But don't touch it. Oh, no. It's much too big for you. Don't touch it. Though it's long and sleek, it's true. What's the point of Ronnie James? Making my life matter. Making it matter. I mean, as far as we know, we only have one run. I don't want to atrophy. It took me so long to finally be comfortable in my own skin as a performer when I had the epiphany that stand-up had to be my way of life after 17 years as an actor and in the improv world of Second City. And it was a calling. I came back from Los Angeles after three years chasing the sitcom dream. 47 k in debt with a daughter and another one on the way. Had a little bit of lift with uh, some commercials I got and things just to, you know, cover the rent. But I never had three months of rent covered. If I had three months of rent covered, rather, I figured we were doing pretty good. I didn't want to live straddling the poverty line anymore, but not to say it was just an economic or commercial necessity that drove me to stand up. It was a decision to empower myself rather than wait for someone else to validate my life. And it allows me, in my own simple way, to connect the dots and make sense of the chaos we're all walking through in the language of laughs. But but, let me, I'm going to interrupt you and say, why does it matter to matter? That's a great question. Because I think you'd be sinning against your purpose in life if you didn't. I mean, it's so great being alive. You don't want to atrophy. And I've just been, I mean, I was sired by a a feisty little Newfoundlander who was born on this pimple of granite called Vatcher's Island on the southwest coast of Newfoundland in 1932 when life was short and seagulls were supper. I mean, the guy, Bernie James, my father, Uh, who married my mom, who was a a coal miner's daughter from Glace Bay, Cape Breton. She was a homemaker and dad worked for the phone company, but he was in tune with the seasons and he was in tune with life. He was fully engaged with his day. Uh, I inherited that energy to be engaged. I had the benefit of a post-secondary education and not nearly as tough a life as he had. I mean, when He was seven years old. They moved from Newfoundland to Halifax. He had a paper route in the mornings. Set his alarm. Used to tell me he'd set his alarm for 6.30. No, not 6.30, 5.30. So, uh, and then he'd set it again for a quarter to six so we could get up and have his porridge and then go pick his newspapers up. He had to walk from Hunter Street, uh, working class section of Halifax, up to Bloomfield School. He'd pick up his newspapers there and then walk down what was then a dirt road, a Bayer's Road, and deliver his newspapers to the barracks, Depot 7, because all the soldiers were mustering in Bedford Basin to head over to Europe for World War II. Uh, I mean, during the VE Day riots when he was uh, 12 years old, when Halifax exploded in this post-war Bacchanalian public fornication of liquor and sex on the streets because they locked the liquor stores up. A sailor threw a chair through the window and that was it. And he made 57 bucks. And I said, what did you do with the money? And of course he said, well, I should have put it in a mutual fund, but they didn't exist then. So I took all my buddies to the movies. (laughs) So there was a great joy of life. I think that the way I saw him take pride in his humble house, make the best of his front lawn, put a garden in every year, go to the woods in the fall for partridge. Then when the colder weather came, go for deer. And you're seeing all this as a kid, right? I traveled with him. When Mm -hmm. I was old enough, I went 
I, I went with them. And don't get me wrong, you know, it wasn't an idyllic, uh, you know, movie of the week. I mean, the guy had a fucking hair trigger temper. He mm. could walk around the house. So when I came home with math marks that were you know, my <laughs> my teacher in grade, <laughs> grade seven, Mr. Baker, uh, who... Uh, taught my father <laughs> during World War II and taught me, he would phone your house if you made lower than 65 out of 100 on a math test. Mm -hmm. So I'd be walking home and that test would be burning a hole in my pocket like the map of Bonanza. You know, I just lost anybody under 40 who's listening to your show. <laughs> but my math marks, as I used to say in my show, could get my father's Newfoundland born noggin, spinning tomato head red off his shoulders and him rattling profanities in me that had rival Wordsworth for poetry. Jumping German, Jesus, you better start passing math, you sawed off little Christer there's going to be a stranger in hell for breakfast by the Lord snapping arseholes. Said, I kept flunking just to hear the alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> See, that, and that's one of the things, and I don't want to jump too far in ahead, but your your alliterations, uh, your own alliterations are are poetry to me. Um, but you're saying you got them from your dad. Well, he or at least could, the inspiration. Yeah, well, he could really tell a joke. Uh, but ah. uh, he could. He, he was of the generation that told jokes. I still don't think he ever understood what stand up was. That you observe the world in just what you see or read, and then um, regurgitated in regurgitated. a witty, witty way or whatever. Right. Yeah. And uh, he said, "You can use this one in your show." And I'd say, "Dad, I don't. I don't tell <laughs> jokes." And uh, Mum was really funny. Too. I mean, she still is. She's 89 years old. We lost dad uh, several years ago at uh, COPD and renal cell carcinoma. But I will tell you, he was swinging for the fences right to the very end. We put him in palliative care and he only lasted 48 hours, a poor little guy. But I went into the hospital and this beautiful brunette had just, uh, <laughs> she was just gorgeous, this yeah. young nurse, about 30 years old, 28 maybe. And she just administered a catheter to his penis. And I went around to his side of the bed. She was pulling her hand away and he said, Ronnie, look at this beautiful young nurse just picked up for me at Canadian Tire. <laughs> and I thought, geez, man. <laughs> uh, so it was this continuity of spirit is essential, I think. And I was fortunate. I had a, a good home and- uh, You did, it, it was it was a good home, your mom and your dad? Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, we fought, we argued. And, I mean, normal, was, but, but a normal a home, but, well, but, there was but that, nothing nasty. You know, that, you know, there was that volcanic Newfoundlander aspect to yeah. everything, right? Yeah. Where, you know, it's uh, sometimes you're walking on eggshells. I used to laugh sometimes because you'd hear this, you'd hear him whistling going downstairs to cut some molding or some baseboard. You'd hear whistling. <laughs> and then there'd be quiet. And then you'd hear this. Jesus, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus. Why didn't I measure that son of a whore twice? Uh, but then also, you know, uh, it, was, uh, it was a home where the threshold was crossed by hundreds and people were always welcome. That's classic East Coast, too. It is classic East Coast, although I will tell you, People weren't crossing the threshold to all the neighbors' places all the time. But our place, my friends, my sister's friends, and uh, mom was the quintessential hostess, and there was always a pot of tea on or biscuits, or they drank his dark rum at the kitchen table and burnt their tongue on tea that was, you, you could skin a pig on mom's hot tea. So anyway, I, I mean, I like to set the context of family first, but let me say that my decision to follow this career, I mean, they didn't get it. You know, I mean, come on, man. The phone company's waiting for me. I had a BA in history with, a, uh, actually, it was a major in binge drinking and a minor in hot knives. But uh, I did the, I made the best with what I was given. And at, if there was anything I learned at university, it was to channel my life force and do what I ended up doing. Wanted to get in on Saturday Night Live like everybody. I saw them on TV in 77. And uh, I thought, wow, this is it. And then, you know, you'd start like any comedian, making people laugh in the classroom or kitchen. But it's an exponential leap from that cocoon of family and friends who think you're funny to being funny on stage. And that's where the lifetime of hard work comes in. If you're enjoying this interview... Check out my interview with George Strombolopoulos, equally an influential and highly intelligent Canadian entertainer. And as well, pick up Ron James' brand new book, All Over the Map, Rambles and Ruminations from the Canadian Road. Ah, leave it to Ron to even make the title of his book an alliteration. I have two songs in my catalog that I consider humorous. They're completely tongue-in-cheek, so don't take them too seriously. 
but I had a lot of fun recording them. They were not written by me, but by my good friend Randy Clark, who sadly was lost to us way too soon. I didn't want to see his music lost, as well as his life, and so I recorded this little beauty. A song that I know Ron would get. From my debut CD, this is Don't Touch It. Hey, what are you doing over there? I never realized you were so insecure Using all your childish lies to get me over here I know that there is only one thing that you crave You want it in your hands to touch it and to play But don't touch it, oh no, it's much too big for you Don't touch it Though it's long and sleek, it's true Don't lay your nasty hands upon its tall and glistening shine Don't touch it, don't touch it, it's mine Well, I never realized you were so immature Still, you won't change my mind, I'd like to keep it pure And though you thought you'd worship it and keep it for yourself Girl, I've only fingered it once or twice myself So don't touch it Oh, it's much too big for you Don't touch it Though it's long and sleek, it's true Don't lay your greasy fingers on its tall and straightened length Don't touch it, don't touch it Have strength Well, she talked her sweet talk And I'm telling you no lie She grabbed it right in front of me And let her fingers fly By the time she was a finished There was a spinning round my head I felt I must apologize So I turned to her and I said Well, I've never realized That you do that so well I wasn't gonna let you touch <laughs> Ah, but what the hell I hope you have forgiven me Cause talented you are It's just that all musicians hate To lend a new guitar So don't touch it Stop playing with that thing Don't touch it Cause you could break the string Don't you scratch the finish Stop messing with the hole Don't touch it Don't touch it You've been told Maybe one more anyway Maybe Ray Barnett or something like that Come on hey, Get your hands off my CDs too Sheesh You know what? Aggressor Adventures While being the largest liveaboard dive operation in the world Is so much more They have safaris and excursions to the corners of the globe Exciting opportunities to see vast archaeology History and natural wonders I've been traveling and diving with them for years, and I cannot endorse them enough for being simply the best there is at making sure your worldwide adventure is a safe, comfortable, and exciting one. Take it from a guy who has done a lot of adventuring. Who do I travel with on my vacations? Aggressor Adventures. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. I was so far gone in the great hoat there, I hadn't seen a Tim Hortons donut chain for three and a half days. <laughs> you know you're up there far when you haven't seen a Tim's, huh? A beacon, a refuge for the road-weary traveler. Won't find any saucy urban Starbucks way up there, will you? Starbucks, that's an overrated little corner of the planet, isn't it? I go to Starbucks when I want to see what the world would be like if Hitler had won the war. <laughs> oh, always giving you their fresh-faced Aryan efficiency to go with their oh-so-insincere up-with-people-smile and their 1795 cafe latte. <laughs> Jeez, at that price, girl, and a sponge bath must be coming too, is it? Not so Tim's. Tim's is a home away from home for the lumpen proletariat on life's hard highway. And here they come, look at them folks. Mom and dad in their salt cake wind star. 
bound for some godforsaken corner of the country for another hockey tournament. <laughs> Both of them going from dawn till dusk. God bless them, not a spare minute to themselves. Lord Jesus, I haven't ridden bareback on Saturday night since little Gordy got bumped up to Baname. <laughs> Now every spare minute of their waning youth is spent shuttling the hockey-hungry little Christer to every rink between Kitchener and Beijing. <laughs> but lo and behold, good people, some saint of the double-double and honey dip <laughs> has delivered their little ship to the calm harbor of a Tim Jeezley Horton. <laughs> We've all been there too, haven't we? as we knock the snow from our boots and step over the threshold. We're enveloped in that iridescent cocoon of familiarity. And the halogen lights in the ceiling so bright, they're almost searing the friggin' retinas out of your eyes. <laughs> Soon as your pupils stop bleeding, you see, she's there to greet you. Look at her, God lover. That Tim Horton's maven behind the counter. That bovine Betty with the unpretentious country wide ass. Sporting that fashionably foxy hairnet. Slide me up a double-double and a chocolate dip, darling, because you got me warm in the secret spot. Let me ask you something that's fascinated me a lot about our backgrounds, our backdrop, our histories. Uh, in my own life, I had to break through the very insular bubble of the area I grew up in, Mimico, Ontario, uh, get out of what would have been a lifetime of drinking beer and working at shipping and receiving. I hear you, bro. You know, and there's a book written called Hillbilly Elegy, and that, that guy became Read a lawyer. It. Yep, and he talks about this yeah. insane, you know, kind of toxic peer pressure. They're all packing heat down there, too. I mean, it's crazy, right, in uh, his book. Yes, oh, it's, a scary, it's a scary place to be. So where you were and with your ideals of acting at first, because it yeah. wasn't co comedic uh, work at, at first, it was acting at first, did you have to break away from oh, toxic yeah. pressure? Absolutely. Family and peers? Yeah, and everybody wants you to, yeah. I mean, I mean, I didn't have to say, you know, see you later. I'm not coming back until I land a role. But I was, I wanted to, I wanted to land something legitimate so that they didn't think I was, you know, following some, some flaky pipe dream, right? Well, well, did, did you get, were you too good for us now, Ronnie? Are you not going to, you can't work here? Did you ever get that? that no, sort of no, because there was no infrastructure for what I wanted to do there then. I mean, this hour didn't exist. I mean, there was really no film industry. There was no, the only option for acting was to get something at, at Neptune and I was never considered, you know, yeah, I had to prove myself mm -hmm. and uh, it was, breaking in was maybe a radio play at CBC or something. So, so, so I had to go to Toronto to get into Second City yeah. and I had to make that effort. So I bartended for a year and, you know, I always had bread in my pocket. I took acting classes. But what really channeled my energies in those days were the classes at 110 Lombard Street, the old fire hall, the iconic home of the proving ground for ensemble comedy. And it was excellent. There were excellent teachers and it allowed me to... Well, one of the great things about Second City, it can appeal to so many. It, it, it can develop your physical attributes as a physical comedian, and, and you can draw on reference levels. It teaches you to be fast, and it teaches you to give and take. And it was great. And I finally got in, and hmm. uh, in the in the Torco. And once I got in the Torco, making 350 bucks a week touring the back roads of Ontario. In fact, just down the road here, not... 30 minutes from your house. That's where we played. We played Deerhurst. Deerhurst Resort. Yeah, 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 yeah man. Yeah. yeah, it was wild. We did the highways and byways of Toronto in the wintertime. Just, you know, seven of us traveling in a second city van and people would be looking in the window wondering where John Candy is. <laughs> and uh, it's a <laughs> piano player, a stage manager and six actors. But it was a great time. And I remember reading an article on Jackie Gleason once. He talked about the days when they were making 50 bucks a week, just young, struggling actors skating at Rockefeller Center and maybe going for a sandwich afterwards. 
And there is something halcyon and, and holy about those early days. Innocent. Yeah, it was so new. And we were all discovering it. And, and finally, we were allowed to actualize and be in the company of like-minded individuals who otherwise were, for want of a better phrase, I guess, we were, you know, we were traveling misfits. Mm. And we were all together. It was it was a comedic, you know, dirty half dozen. <laughs> and, and so just to dip a little bit one more time back into your past, when you started at least making 350 bucks a week, was that a, um, a vindicating moment for you with your dad and your mom? Were you able to say, hey, I'm, and did they say, oh, okay, well, Ronnie's making some money. He's doing all right. Or, or was it more of a longer term? Eventually, I'm sure they got it. But uh, when, when you- did they get it? They got it when I got my first film. Uh, I, I co-starred with Brooke Adams in a CBS movie of the week called um, Special People, True Story of the people, Famous People Players, and I played a, a young handicapped adult who had the hots for Brooke Adams. It, you know, I thought I'd grab the tail of the comet, man. I was getting compliments from CBS, and uh, I was still on stage at Second City at the time. So, you know, I went away to do my film and then I came back and I was trying to figure out why everybody was so quiet around me. It's because I landed some work. So the politics backstage at Second City sucked. I was never good at that. I loved the funny, but, uh, and I loved the road with everybody. But once we got down to main stage, I think the stakes got higher. I'm not saying it was all bad. I never really had the same level of fun again. And I mean fun, uh, the fun, the joy, the freedom of the work as when you always had to be at the top of your game, you know? And so it just didn't live up to my expectations, nor do nor do I think the expectations of the people who hired me. But I learned my craft. I worked Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and did two shows Fridays, two on Saturday, improv Mondays to Thursdays. And the giants of the day were dropping into Second City. I mean, Robin Williams had just filled the uh, Hummingbird uh, Center for three sold-out shows and everybody and anybody who was doing movies. And the standard you wanted to aspire to, SCTV, was rocking the world. And actually, good good point. Who who were your heroes at that point? Who drove you to keep thinking, I could, I could, I could be like that, I could do that? Well, of course, I loved Belushi uh, in my day, you know. Yeah. And um, when I was a kid, of course, 15 years old, I mean, the summertime replacement shows... Jonathan Winters, Richard Pryor, I just thought that Jonathan Winters was blessed. <laughs> you know, I mean, a locked off camera with him in a room and a few boxes of hats and a chair. Yeah. Guy filled half an hour, man. Yeah. And Pryor was just so, I mean, I still have his DVDs. He was just so incendiary. I like Pryor because he had something to say. And I like Jonathan Winters because he was so free. How about George Carlin? George Carlin, of course, seven words you can't say on television. I mean, they're still standard. I saw him get the Kennedy honors years ago, and they still had to bleep all the words. <laughs> uh, I will say, though, uh, just let me get back to that question about my folks. I think what confused them, I had a nice run when I was younger. You know, I had the CBS movie of the week. I had lots of commercials, which paid my rent and, and allowed my girlfriend and I at the time, who eventually became my wife for 23 years, to take nice trips and things and go back and forth to Nova Scotia. And I got pilots and I would get guest spots and things. But what confused them was when the bottom fell out. And the bottom did fall out. I mean, I had lots of great years when I first started. Uh, I remember making, I think I made $101,000 in 1985. So I was doing guest spots on SCTV, had a bunch of commercials on. I had that movie of the week. I had a pilot. And then for 10 years, I never made more. After that year, I never made more than $37,000. And how old would you have been then during that 10 years? Well, that was in my 30s. and yeah. That was in my 30s. Hard, isn't it? It was so hard. Yeah. I think it was from about 28 to 36 Maybe, maybe younger. There's a sacrifice involved with these artistic ambitions that a lot of people don't understand and get, but it does lead me to the question, well, then why? If it was, was it that you had tasted it and then it became like almost like an addiction? Like, I just want to get back to that again? Or what kept the fire burning? Well, that's a great question. That's an ex- it's, it's pursuit and it's dogged determination. I didn't want to give up. Yeah. And after a while, you get to the point where you think, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe I can be a forest ranger. I mean, I wrestled with those thoughts. Maybe I can go back to school and get my master's. What would you do, Ron? Do you want to be a lawyer? Really? I mean, you're funny. 
Mm-hmm. This is what gives you the most joy is seeing people laugh. Mm-hmm. And I had to hit bottom in Los Angeles to begin to redefine myself. And when I went down to do a series called My Talk Show in 1990, a very talented actress, this is uh, Deb McGrath and Linda Cash from Second City, uh, they created this show, Andrew Alexander, the impresario at the time. He sold it to Imagine TV, Ronnie Howard's company. So we had an in, had an in. I had an opportunity to get an, an H1 at the time. Which is a working visa working for the United visa, States. Yep. Right. My daughter was 18 months old. Those days in Toronto in 1990, there was 0% rent. We were still renting, had a nice place on the beach, but it was an adventure. And we were, you know, uh, in love and a young family and exciting time and... My buddy and his wife were already down there because they'd opened up Second City in Santa Monica. And, and this, uh, we're talking now about we're, we're at the end of that wonderful 10 year run. Yeah. And you're going to LA. But at this point in your brain, you're still on the run. This is like, oh, I'm just, I'm so big now, or, or I'm doing so well now. Let's go to the States. Let's go to LA. Let's take it well, next level. Well, the great adventure. I mean, yeah. I, I hopped, as I said, in Shaky Town, which I'll get to later, we hopped a 747 Conestoga wagon and followed well worn trails of the jet stream west like so many other beaming pilgrims before me. Canadian pilgrims. Yes, brother, because we all make that pilgrimage. And I will say right now that chasing the American sitcom dream and its dissolution sired my Canadian one. Interesting. Yeah. And because my relationship with my career and my ambition was so benign and so codependent on an agent to drive it for me. I haven't had an agent in 25 years. And even when I reached out after my series was canceled here, whose clients I hired and put in, they all passed. I don't want to get too metaphysical about everything, but I think that's the universe's way of just saying, look, man, it's not meant to be. You're, mm. you're on your right road. Stop fighting you're, it. You're, you're on your right path. Yeah. Stay, stay to the path you're on, to quote Joseph Campbell, and we'll get to that. But um, I went down there, and we got a townhouse and on a hillside that used to be an orange grove that was torn down to make room for people like us. <laughs> and uh, I remember the first time we went to Target, uh, not 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 Target, but uh, the Price Club down there at the time before <laughs> yeah. it was called Costco. Yeah, and it's like, boy, wine, seven bucks a bottle. Jesus, get ten. <laughs> and so I was, you know, I lost my father for days on end at Sears Tool Department. <laughs> Every time he came home from work, he had a new wrench. Have a gander at that, Ronnie. Buy <laughs> uh, four feet of tungsten steel chrome wrap wrench, a buck ninety five steel. You don't get that at Canadian Tire. <laughs> and uh, so it was. Uh, Were you a fish out of water with all with all of your background and and? Oh yeah, yeah, even, yeah, yeah, yeah. The writers on the my talk show they would. Come up to me, these New York writers from Brooklyn, and they'd say, "How do you spell Jeezley?" <laughs> but I was a. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, every every Newfoundlander listening to this right now just went, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> Jesus, buddy. Anyway, I got down there, and I had sixty-five shows guaranteed in the original contract. Then there was a gutting at Imagine TV, and all the people who liked us were gone. Yep, new guy was in. Oh, been there, done that. Carry had going. to recast it. Yeah, so I went from. Uh, which is paltry money compared to the figures that are thrown around. But I was supposed to do, and these shows were sold to syndication, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So all the channels would air them in the evening, all the different channels around America. And it was the largest single sale of of one show to independent channels across the States. Five shows a week at 3,000 bucks a week. And I got the call, listen, congratulations, you're still in the show, but there's good news and bad news. The good news is you're still in the show. The bad news is you don't have 65 shows guaranteed. You've got 15 shows guaranteed, and it's 450 bucks a show. Ugh. And I had my family down there. You, I didn't have, my, you didn't have a contract protecting you from that? I guess not. No, it was no. This no, is, no. I, okay. I mean, I had a, a, a sim, a, a clueless agent in Canada. And, yeah. Forget about it. I mean, and once you're down there, they wash their hands of everything. It was just, and I didn't have one down there. So I started the chase, looking for agents, looking for representation. To use the quote about the wagon train, I mean, Mm. we were, we were stuck in the sand somewhere, Uh, stuck in the snow somewhere around the Donner Pass, (laughs) right? But I stayed the course and eventually got an agent, got representation, talked my way into more episodes and stayed the course until... Our cast picture was on Newsweek on Tuesday. We were canceled on Thursday. And on Monday, I was chest deep in a hole on Robert Urich's front yard, God bless him, pulling a tree out with my buddy's father's landscaping company. Up to your chest in muck. Muck. A troll in a hole covered in muck. Yeah. I remember 
the guy who played Jake Spoon in Lonesome Dove walks out the front door dressed for a day at the polo fields at the Will Rogers Ranch. And my buddy Jay at the time points at me in the hole and says, hey, how you doing, Robert? This is my buddy Ron. He's an actor, too. <laughs> and so we had no time to discuss the impact of the Stanislavski method on contemporary American <laughs> cinema. You told me that story before about Robert. Er- uh, how do you say his name again? Yurik. Yurik. And I've just always found it so fascinating. That isn't it amazing sometimes when... Clearly, even though you've spun that story into a good joke, a true joke, a real joke, the reality is it that story hasn't left, that moment has not left your heart and your brain ever. I encoded it in my DNA. Exactly. It's like, I'm not, I'm going to remember that. And I've had that happen to me several occasions. Let me, let me tell you one of mine. I was uh, doing rock videos with Rob Courtley, Champagne Motion Pictures. We were doing Rush and Corey Hart and Kim Mitchell and all these bands. And I was, we were doing Helix, a Canadian rock band, right? At that time, I just wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be Neil Young. I wanted to be Jimmy Page. I wanted to be a rock star, right? I was, it was all about the music then. But I had this side work, and I remember the guitar player from Helix, he said, oh, yeah, you want to be, uh, you got any music? He said, oh, yeah, I played him. I gave him a cassette, and he listened. And he goes, damn, son, that's really, that's really good. And then he just looked at me, and he just goes, well, what are you doing here? And it was like he put a dagger right in my heart. I was like, what am I doing here? Wow. I'm building a set on a rock video for some other some other rock band. I, I want my music. I want to be playing my music. I don't and I went home. I think I cried when I went home. And I realized, you know, you. and I and I think that was when I, I said I've got to make a change. And uh, uh and and so my point being that but that's your tipping point. I mean, tipping point, that's what yes. Joseph Campbell would say is the inciting incident to the hero's journey. And yeah. he's played a huge role in my life. Really? How? Campbell. Well, because I read him an awful lot in Los Angeles, but I don't think you've finished your story. Carry no, on. no, no. That's no that that you. That's it. I was going to the tipping point. I think we have several tipping points in our lives. Yeah, we do. Attention. And they keep and, so and the circle one. closes, opens again. I think I'm ready to define the third phase uh, mm. of my life now. You know, I'm 63, and I want to stay productive. And of course, the boomers are all defining, redefining what age means. You're in, you're just, you're just deep in muck. That's the beginning of a year of unemployment. Mm. Constant rejection, getting close, where you come home, and in those days was an answering machine. And I remember my wife saying, can you say hi first instead of walking through the door and saying, did my agent phone? I mean, that's what that awful place does to you. It makes you so dependent on what others think of you. Because you're constantly putting yourself forward, reading lines for shitty pilots. That's the culture down there. Oh, it's awful. The culture of what does everybody else think of me. It's horrifying. It's worse than starting high school. Yeah. That's what Hunter S. Thompson said about the place. It's high school with money, right? It was at that point in time when I was at a work, the cafe scene was just starting. And um, I didn't have the cojones to try stand-up yet. I tried it first in Yuck Yucks years ago in Toronto. I remember having a great first set and then bombing miserably for seven more. I didn't have the spine for the work at that time, which is why I went to Second City and felt far more comfortable in an ensemble. It's all growth rings on the tree, right? And I think because I still needed people to validate my funny because I was still used to that uh, having a circle of pals and friends where you're always riffing and bouncing off each other and had a great set of friends growing up in Halifax. Yeah, but making making some guys laugh who just smoked some joints and and drank some beer on a a Saturday night is a lot different than standing up on a stage and staring down 48 people that don't like you. That's the exponential leap and that's why I take, I, I, I cannot suffer the glib Oh, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to do stand up just to work a few things out. Will you? Will you? <laughs> just to work a few things out? Okay, well, you go up an amateur night and watch that solo spot stare at you like the unblinking judgmental eye of God when you have the temerity to think you're funny and all your, all your feeling is nothing but glaring contempt from a quiet house and you feel your soul run out your belly button to the butt strewn street. That's when you'll realize how exponential the leap is. Because as soon as you step from behind that curtain to the stage, to that spot, and I still remember that night on Bay Street at Yucks, it's like you're untethered from the mothership. You're taking a walk in space and you're there and you got to survive. And it makes you stronger. But the longer you stay in it, the more uh, you get comfortable in your own skin. Mm. I mean, it it has a wonderful influence on life too. 
it's a much different context in Canada than it is in the States because people compartmentalize you here. At least the, uh, it's like my friend says, he said, uh, you know, who writes uh, for television, said, look, we don't have, she's created her own show, said, uh, we don't have a talent problem in Canada. We've got a television executive problem in Canada. <laughs> oh, you know, you know how can Baroness hey, how can how that. can Baroness von Sketch sit on a desk for five years and not be picked up? I mean, and each network has their own sin. Each network yeah. has their own, uh, you know. Uh, and it, you know what? To, to, no, to keep the vitriol going, it's actually gotten worse, in well, my opinion. Quite I've, worse. So I've I've been you know, here's my here's my big my big braggadocio. So I've been nominated. Uh, I think it's got to be some kind of record, twenty seven times for Canadian Screen Award. No shit. And I've won three. I won for um, uh, tw- 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 <laughs> twenty seven times. Twenty seven. There. Yeah, I don't have them on the wall here because I don't want to do that. Oh man. I've won three. Two for writing. And one for camera. I'm still bragging because I drink for free north of the tree line. You know that. <laughs> and, and I don't. <laughs> uh, but I, it was a weird thing. Every time I won, that was the year I didn't go. So I actually never once got up on stage oh, to accept that? an award. And yet, my, but my goal, my goal was if I ever am there when I win, oh. and actually I'm going to go up and the, what I'm going to say I'll get my quick thank yous done. A blistering and then diatribe. I, oh, I want absolutely. It, man. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm going to say, if you're out there and you're you're an executive in Canada and you're you want to take a risk on something, God bless you because the rest of you are so fucking safe about everything and scared of everything and scared of your own. And basically, you're all going, what are they doing to make in the States? What are they doing in the States? What are they doing in the States? We just want to do what they're doing in the States. Can you do what they're doing in the States? Let's do that. Yeah, let's do it. Derivative, 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 derivative. If it wasn't for Jane Minge and Anna Stambolic, I would never have existed. Isn't that And great? down in the States, it became it became the same way. If it wasn't for Steve Burns at Discovery down in the United States, Survivor Man never would have appeared. And those people said, you know, simply this. This is what they said. I think you got something here, Les. Isn't that That's great? That's it. That was their risk. I think you've got something here. Take sixty thousand dollars and make your show. Isn't that something? Isn't that wonderful? But yeah. that's not the je- that's not the way it normally is. It's the way what you were saying, and and I don't want to become two Canadians bitching about Canada. No, but no, no. Boy, oh I, I boy, we because, could. You know, I had a good run at the CBC, right? Uh, with my specials, I'm very proud of those. Mm-hmm. You know, I did nine of them. They were record breaking. They were making one point. They were drawing one point four million people. Every New Year's Eve. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's the last four. That's three of the last four did 1.4 million people. It's Canada comedy gold right there. And I was proud of them. And I had a great writing team, worked with Scott Montgomery, Paul Pogue, and Pete Zedlacher, God bless him, came in to pinch hit for me uh, when dad passed away and I was back home. I had a, a wonderful writing room, too, on the series, captained by uh, the affable and accommodating uh, Gary Campbell, who has his own show now on CTV called Carter. It was a room that I wanted to be um, encouraging and the antithesis of the experience I had writing for the short period of time on this hour's 22 minutes, my own series, uh, Blackfly, which uh, I will get to in a little bit. I remember uh, Blackfly well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the fact, <laughs> that, the fact that I sold it to Global on the premise of uh, satirizing current social and political trends in the context of the 18th century Canadian fur trade. Yeah. And I remember yeah. one day I walked into the fort and, and, uh, and they, <laughs> this insipid fucking set designer they hired, he goes, I have the fort you're looking for. I said, really? What? Direct from the Raj. The Raj? As India. What, and I just remember having these crazy arguments. You got the pointy things up. Get the pointy things up. But look, it's the Raj. We're on Lake Superior in 1783, <laughs> numb nuts. So, but those things. But anyway, uh, you need a team. You need a team that's taking your ship in the same direction. I mentioned I couldn't tell a joke to save my life. And that is sadly very true. What I do have, however, is quick wit. So one night, I was able to make the man himself, Ron James, almost fall off his chair laughing. We were both at the Canadian Screen Awards, and he was sitting one table over from me. However, he hadn't seen me and didn't know I was there. By this time, I had already connected with him, and so I had his text number. While the insanely boring host with the horrifyingly safe and terrible comedy routine droned on up on stage, I noticed Ron was reading his texts. I pulled out my phone and sent him this note. Stop fucking texting and pay attention to the show, you moron. His phone went 
and he looked up and frantically looked around the room to finally settle, only ten feet to his right, on my gaze. When he saw me, he just lost it. I thought, there you go, my friend. I owe you at least one giggle for all the times you have distressed my overworked brain with your brilliant humor. This was only part one of my chat with Ron James, so stay tuned for part two. This podcast is, as the saying used to go, brought to you by Aggressor Adventures. Choose your adventure. Surviving Life with Les Stroud is presented by the Apostrophe Podcast Network and is mixed by Keith Ullman. You're surviving life with me, Les Stroud. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Survivor Man Les Stroud, as I have hundreds of videos there and more going up every week. From Survivor Man Archive to Bigfoot to Wild Harvesting Tips to Urban Disaster Survival. It's all there and it's all free. My brand new series, Wild Harvest, featuring local foraging and turning those wild edibles into sumptuous dishes, is now on National Geographic Asia, PBS stations in the United States, and Cottage Life Television in Canada. The brand new special, Surviving Disasters with Les Stroud, is now on a PBS station near you in the United States or on my YouTube channel. And my brand new children's book, Wild Outside, written for your kids. It's all about getting your kids into the out of doors. And it's out now. Google it. I'm an easy find on Google for those and so much more that I produce during any given year, no matter what's happening on the world stage. We'll figure this life out together. Cue that rip and harmonica solo, Keith. Aggressor Adventures. For over 35 years, we've designed adventure vacations around the world, helping travelers experience the majesty of the oceans and the call of the wild on our dive trips, river cruises, and safaris. From the Galapagos Islands and the South Pacific to the land of the pharaohs on the Nile River, with personalized service in every vacation destination. Aggressor. Adventures of a Lifetime.